Hi, welcome to Chemistry 3006. I want to take a little break from the hydrosphere now and talk about the world energy consumption and how it relates to global CO2 emissions. Here's a graphic that I found from the Guardian newspaper last year showing it's an atlas. It's an atlas of the world pollution, uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Um, essentially it's a bubble graph so you can see uh, the radius of the bubble is proportional to the country's emissions. So what do we notice first? Um, well there's the US and China as the two biggest bubbles. Nothing much surprising there. Uh, the US about 5.5 million tonnes of CO2 but that is decreasing uh, at about 7% per annum. I think it's per annum. Uh, and here we have China, which is bigger than the US, and that's increasing at 13.3%. So that makes sense. China is industrialising. It has a bigger population compared to the US. Uh, looking at the next two biggest bubbles, um, we have uh, Russia and India. Russia has a huge land mass. Um, and uh, is still, its emissions are still considerably less than the US and China, and their production, uh, CO2 production is dropping as well. I think that is because of uh, increased growth of forests and uh, fertility of the tundra because of global warming, paradoxically. So you know about Le Chatelier's principle. Whenever you do something, the system responds by resisting the change. If you try and warm the earth by adding CO2, well, Russia warms up and living things start to grow and they take up a little bit more CO2. But what we do know about Le Chatelier's principle is it never comes back to the original equilibrium. Um, yes, uh, the system resists, but it doesn't resist 100% it still manages to increase a bit. Now, here's something quite surprising. Um, there's Russia and India. These are uh, both uh, comparable. In fact, India has uh, overtaken uh, Russia in 2009. This graphic's from 2014. So you can see that India is growing uh, relatively slowly, but it's slow and steady, and it has the biggest population uh, relative, the bigger population out of Russia. In India, although a much smaller landmass. Now let's look at the next biggest bubbles. We have a few big bubbles here in Europe, um, all of them fairly comparable. There's Japan and South Korea. And uh, here we have Iran, Saudi Arabia, South America, and Brazil, and Australia. And Australia. Now these are total emissions. And in the news, it's often stated that, oh, Australia has a, a very small contribution to global warming. Well, not really. I mean, look at these small countries here. Some of these bubbles are so tiny we can't even see them. Some of these bubbles are... But Australia is in probably the Group 3 set of nations, the two biggest nations, and then there's, there's a, uh, Russia, India and Japan, and then pretty close behind, we're in the next group of OECD nations. We are, in absolute terms, not a small CO2 emitter. What makes it worse is that Australia has really a very small population, so our emissions per head are actually quite large. I've calculated that if we ignore the oil producing states, such as Saudi Arabia and uh, the Gulf states, um, these have politically very difficult time if they don't use fossil fuels. Uh, so they are large emitters um, because pretty much they've got nothing else to sell and the stuff they do sell is worth a lot of money, so that's what they do. Hard to imagine what else they would do if they didn't sell oil, sand. Uh, but ignoring those Gulf states, uh, we're actually the fourth highest CO2 emitter in the world. And I got this from the World Bank 2014. You can check here if I got this right. Oh yes, how nice. There's the URL there if I hover over it. 
Uh, we come after Trinidad and Tobago, the US and Luxembourg. I'm not 100% sure why Trinidad and Tobago are so high there. I think they have quite a lot of industrial processing going on there. I think there's an alumina refinery there and it uses up quite a lot of energy. US of course is a big user. Luxembourg is a very high uh, rich nation and I think it burns uh, coal to do the emissions. So we're up there in terms of per capita emissions. Now even worse probably is that the figures in terms of CO2 emissions for Australia, which make us the fourth largest per person emitter, they do not take into account our coal exports. Actually, most of our coal exports uh, go to China. And uh, those Chinese are the ones who burn our coal. Um, but sadly for them, uh, the coal that they burn from us counts as their emissions. Uh, it's a little bit strange, I think. It's, uh, it's somehow like comparing uh, those responsible for smoking-related cancer are the smokers, not the producers of the cigarettes. So Australia is the producer of the coal, the dirty coal, and, uh, well, we just send it off and say, well, we don't care what they do with that. Um, they shouldn't be using it. Of course, it's difficult to see what China could do uh, uh, with its very rapid industrialization. Having said that, uh, China is at the forefront of the introduction of green technologies. They have to because they know not only have, will they be under pressure, international pressure, to reduce their emissions, but they know that they have to because their population is growing so rapidly. And green technologies tend to be very local and they don't need the presence of a large electrical grid. So where does all the energy come from? Um, I found this graphic here. It's not for Australia. Uh, it's a 2015 source from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, seeing as I've taken it from there and they've asked me to give that attribution. I will. Generally speaking, I rip things off the internet and talk about them without giving attribution, that's not very good. But my objective is just to explain things to you, so I hope you don't mind. But here is this Lawrence Livermore uh, graphic showing the sources of energy with their percentages here, and uh, where those energy inputs go in, uh, into four categories, residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation. and uh, what we see is, starting from top to bottom, solar is an incredibly small percentage of what the energy produced. 0.17 in the United States, it's probably more in Australia. Nuclear, we have none in Australia, that's 8.3 in the States. Hydro, 2.47%. Uh, they have a fairly good hydro scheme in the US because they've got uh, some mountains there. We have the Snowy Mountain Scheme it does produce electricity. Uh, it's actually one of the engineering, uh, it, it's an amazing engineering feat, one of the great engineering feats of modern times, actually. Drilling holes through the mountains, making rivers run forwards and backwards, all done by immigrants after the Second World War to keep them out of trouble. But they contributed a lot and several people did die and are basically locked in the concrete uh, of some of those hydro, Snowy Mountain hydro schemes, unfortunately. Uh, wind is 1.73% uh, in the US. Um, Australia is uh, very rapidly coming up on wind. Uh, you may have heard in South Australia that they are planning to go to 50% renewables uh, by I think it's 2040, uh, which there's been a lot of argument about. Uh, some people saying that perhaps they're going too quickly and uh, that is causing fragility in supply because wind can only be harnessed at certain times of the day and uh, that causes the likelihood of 
power cuts to be more like uh, more power cuts and power failures to be more likely because of the uh, because of the lack of frequency and continuity of wind, as was uh, some people said in the recent storms which caused the whole of South Australia to black out. Um, the problem is uh, not really that, but the fact that there isn't a carbon price. If there was a carbon price. Uh, people could mo move fairly quickly to natural gas, which is shown over here, which is a very excellent and efficient source of heating instead of uh, coal power. You can see coal power for down here for America, 17, 18%, 27% natural gas. Um, why is natural gas better than coal? Well, let's look at it. Here's the coal, and you can see this huge black line here. Most of it's being burnt for electricity generation. During the electricity generation, a uh, total of, uh, you can see that there's a lot of input into this and there's a massive amount of rejected heat. So these coal-fired coal power stations, are old generation ones at least, are extremely inefficient, extremely inefficient. Uh, here you can see, uh, about uh, half, 12% out of 36, one third of the energy is used, is actually going into the grid. 25%, uh, 25% of that energy is being just rejected as heat. So this is not good. Compare that to natural gas. Natural gas, uh, of course, some of it goes into electricity generation, which is what we would hope to do to improve grid reliability. Natural gas is good because you can turn it on when the wind is not blowing and you can turn it off when it's not required. But even better is if you don't use it for electricity generation but it goes straight into residential. And if that happens, um, it's a lot more efficient because obviously you're not going through this useless generation of electricity but the heat is going directly to the residential. Or perhaps if in future we can use um, uh, fuel cells which would convert natural gas directly to electricity that would be very nice as well and that would then bypass completely the need for a grid and increased stability commercial we also see something similar uh, and a large amount of natural gas goes to industry uh, you, industry tends to use natural gas because it's it's efficient you know, industry is one of those things which likes to save money and make profits and natural gas is where they pay the least for the most bang for their heating and they don't use a lot of coal. Some industries need coal, uh, high generation uh, steel making coal is still uh, necessary for some steel which Australia produces some of the best there as well. So uh, that's natural gas and coal. Biomass uh, is increasingly used in the United States and in Australia we would have, I guess, something similar, coal seam gas. It's not really biomass, but uh, uh, that production of gas is going ahead, despite the fact that coal seam gas uh, is a little bit dangerous in terms of affecting the water table. Uh, drilling for uh, coal seam gas will release the gases into the water table, which will which will then affect living organisms, because gas is not uh, completely safe. And petroleum here, you can see, is going almost exclusively uh, two thirds of it going into transportation costs, and again, a lot of that is rejected heat. Only five percent goes into uh, the actual uh, use of the product itself. So transportation by petroleum is hugely inefficient, hugely inefficient. This can be dealt with by using trains. Uh, again, we don't know why uh, some governments are very resistant to trains. There's a big outlay to get trains operational. Luckily, Australia has some base, uh, some train lines to build on, as does the United States. And Europe is, is, of course, built very strongly along trains, uh, has a history of that. So they are in very good position to minimise their energy usage. And actually, if we go back to the previous graph and we look at the energy 
uh, production and trends, you can see that Europe is decreasing quite a lot in its uh, CO2 emissions. They have a CO2 emissions trading scheme. So they're doing very, very well uh, on that front, uh, despite what you might think about whether the Europeans actually have a good, <laughs> have sovereign rights. Uh, their governments, generally speaking, Germany, uh, are imposing schemes on the EU which are leading to a good reduction of CO2, perhaps at the r expense of rights of some of the nations. And the UK has exited. Greece probably would have exited if it had the chance, but it didn't. Okay, so this graph is very interesting. Um, it's pretty clear that there's no chance uh, at the current time that solar can quickly replace petroleum because uh, fossil fuels. If we add up the fossil fuels, we have 27 natural gas, 34 petroleum, 17 coal. Um, that's already natural gas and petroleum is 50%, uh, 50% uh, and we're getting up pretty close to 70% for uh, the fossil fuels here. Natural gas is a great improvement if we can go off that transition from coal to natural gas and then perhaps to something else, wind and solar. But it's pretty clear that frequency issues uh, and storage issues, the ability to store wind power and use it later at a later date, later time via batteries, is going to be a very significant thing that has to be developed and I'm sure people are just waiting to get their battery packs onto their solar power and be free of their electricity bills. Now I want to talk about uh, a very some very exciting news uh, I think so uh, talking about global CO2 emissions and uh, basically the, the fact is uh, the decoupling uh, of CO2 production and GTP. What do I mean by that? Well, in the past, uh, the use of oil, the use of energy was very, very strongly linked, highly correlated with the production, with, with GDP, which generally is equated with how rich a nation is, probably more accurately correlated with, with how rich the companies in the country are, not necessarily how, uh, with how the populace, how rich the populace is, uh, but in most social nations with wealth redistribution, GDP is pretty well correlated with individual wealth. And what's been happening is that uh, use of petroleum which is correlated with CO2 emissions, is going down. Yet GDP is going up. That has never happened in the past. Normally, uh, if petroleum usage goes down, GDP goes down. That means you have a recession. But let's look at here, except, excepting the recent collapse here in 2009, a very horrible collapse of, of the bank causing terrible global instability. Uh, there was a big bounce back, but now you can see in pink uh, the real GDP growth. Now, after 2009, there was a, a big jump back, but then with the injection of funds, uh, sorry about that, with the injection of funds to uh, increase uh, liquidity in the uh, world economy, uh, but then after a while people realised that it wasn't really working and it's now global growth is very, very flat. It is growing positive here and this data is from 2014, but you can see that the GDP is increasing and for the first time, this is the first time it's ever happened, uh, CO2 emissions are going down. So that's great. It's not great for petroleum engineers, but it, it means it's possible that CO2 and fossil fuel usage can go down while GDP will go up. It's going to be pretty flat for a long time, obviously, uh, and the more resistance people have to changing to different mode of energy use, uh, the longer that transition is going to take. 
Um, but look, it's quite good if things are fairly constant because constant things are sustainable things. What's not sustainable is exponential growth. So uh, there's a lot of uh, campaigns on the way. For example, The Guardian has uh, a campaign to stop fossil fuel usage called Keep It In The Ground. Uh, a lot of super funds or pension funds are, uh, I, are divesting themselves from investing in fossil fuels. They've already divested in investing in um, uh, cigarettes and tobacco. And now some of them are thinking, well, actually, it's not morally correct to invest in fossil fuels. And they are, some of them even give uh, you the choice to invest your funds in green alternatives or to just ignore that and just keep investing in oil. I personally invest in green alternatives because, well, it's not out of the goodness of my heart, but I'm looking at this thing here and I'm expecting to measure a lot of money uh, because of that. Well, I hope you enjoyed that uh, view of CO2 emissions and energy usage and the interaction with the global economy. Maybe it might think, make you think about what kind of job you might want to do in the future. You should always get into a growth area. Maybe not this area here. See you later.